wonderful weekend and you're ready for the week. So got lots of stuff to cover in the call today. So here we go. First thing, you want to make sure you've been watching that Five Minute Money Maker on Wednesday. Uh, last Wednesday's was one line a $10 million account for between $18 and $1,800 in marketing costs. And watch this month's Money Maker. Make sure you go back and see that. And then the tape breakdown was don't just listen, spend five, ten minutes verbalizing it. So what we talked about was understand and fix this one thing. You'll make more money you know what to do with. So guys, please, uh, the reason we stopped the Friday calls was so that uh, because you said that you didn't want to spend a whole hour on Friday. So we are sending this out to make sure you're taking advantage of this. Okay, cool. Uh, I just wanted to play uh, one of the guys um, had done lots of Social Securities. Um, uh, Keith had done a lot of Social Security um, seminars in the past, and he was trying to get these people back in to do a uh, a 21-point checklist with. So I want to play here how, how he did on a call that he did with uh, getting a client back in. He did a fantastic job. So uh, take a listen as he gets his client. And he was having real trouble getting these people back in for appointments. Uh, and now with this little script that we uh, – gave him. He's doing a wonderful job of getting them back in to talk to him. So here we go. Hello. Hey, Bob. It's Keith. How you doing? Good, Keith. How you been? I've been great. Happy New Year. Thank you. Same to you. Hey, I don't want to take too much of your time. Uh, just to let you know, the reason I was uh, giving you a call was actually um, there, was, there was a big hiccup in the uh, Social Security system. Um, so I okay. so you know when you get back, I wanted to get together with you, so we could actually do a, a quick band-aid on that, so it doesn't affect you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure if you know, but um, social social security actually kills about twelve thousand people a year. Have you heard that? I'm not sure. They if you, kill them. They kill them. Not they don't actually kill them <laughs> in actuality, but. <laughs> <laughs> they somehow record them as deceased. They the so, you got it. You got it. They okay. somehow they okay. somehow have them as being dead. So um, okay. yeah. So guess what happens to your social security check? Good things or bad things? Bad things. Bad like things. It stops. Exactly. You got it. Um, so okay. yeah. So is that something you want to take care of? You know, when you get back right away, or you, you don't want to delay that, right? Oh yeah. No. No. Okay. Well, how does it, it randomly selects people, or how does? Yeah, it's it's like a uh, you know when people when people die they um, uh, they'll send a you know a, um, a death certificate in, and someone someone will transpose a number or type in a wrong okay. name, type in a wrong name or something like that. So um, okay. yeah, right. so it only it only takes us about a half an hour to get that fixed for you. Um, so okay. when when are you getting back? So how do you do, guys? How about that? So he was having trouble getting people in, and then all of a sudden, boom, this, how much did this guy fight about coming in and taking care of this? Not at all. Just chop, chop, he's in to see him, and it's been working perfectly for all of his uh, uh, clients. So um, great job, Keith. And if you've done Social Security in the past, it's a great way to get people back in. And here's another thing is that Keith called me because he was having trouble getting people in, and I helped him work on that uh, little script so that he could – do that. So if you're having trouble getting in with uh, getting back to warm prospects, people you've seen before, clients that you haven't talked to for three years, call Jeff, call myself. We'll be happy to come up with a little script to get them back in. So I want to make sure you guys are hearing me. Nobody answered that. How did Keith do on that? Give me an answer, somebody. All right, good. So I know some of you are listening. Okay, so uh, with the S&P 500 once again in record high territory, today's chart provides some perspective on the current rally by plotting all major S&P 500 rallies in the last 86 years. The S&P 500 up well over 100% since 2011. 2011 cor uh, correction resulted in a significant 19.4% decline. The current rally is above average in magnitude. So you can see we are now the second longest rally in history. So does that mean the market's going to go down tomorrow? No. What does it mean? And when you get into record territory, <laughs> uh, what does that mean? Yeah, just be cautious. That's exactly. It means that you know what we're at the at the beginning of this or at the end of this. We're nearer to the end than the beginning. That's all we're saying. We don't know when the end is. We're just nearer to the end than the beginning. 
Um, we also hit a, a milestone, which was what? 20,000. And I showed you this uh, about two months ago, but I'm going to show it to you again. So when we've hit milestones in the past, for example, when we hit 100, for the when the Dow hit 100 for the first time, it was 1906. And then it didn't finally leave 100 forever until 1933. How many years is that? So wow, it's awesome. It's 100. That's awesome. And then it went up and down and up and down, 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 and up and down and up and down. But it didn't leave 100 for the last time until 1933. Hit 200 for the, uh, I'm sorry, we don't have the initial one for that. So hit 1,000 for the first time in 1966. But it didn't leave 1,000 until 1982. Do you guys get what I mean when I say it didn't leave 1,000 until 1982? Can I get some yays or nays on that? So it hit 1,000, and then it went up and down and up and up and up and down, but it didn't finally clear 1,000 and leave it forever until 1982. How many years is that? 10,000. Well, it hit it in 1999 and didn't leave it for the last time, we hope for the last time, in 2010. So now we're at a... 20,000, and again, we hit 20,000, does that does this chart bode well or not so well for us seeing un, unbridled growth going forward? Yeah, not so well. So just because it hit 20,000, it, it, it actually, so between the fact that we're the second longest bull market ever, um, and we've got all sorts of political um, intrigue going on, and uh, we've got this 20,000 uh, uh, hit, if you got tons of clients in equities, guess what I'd be doing right now? Because, Jeff, when do we have the most financial advisors come into the 5Q system in the last 16 years? Oh, I'd say uh, 2008 was a big year. Um, 2001 before that was a big year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, was a big year before that. I mean, when, inevitably, when the market crashes, uh, we have a ton of people that get interested because uh, money managers have lost it. If you're if you're working off a trail and the market goes down forty percent, your income went down forty percent too, and your clients it went down more than forty percent. Why, Jeff? Yeah, went down. Yeah, and your clients are mad and they want to leave, and the ones that stay or don't want to be in the market anymore. So yeah, it's it's. And there's nothing worse than when your income's going down. And you're working harder than you've ever worked before because all your clients are calling you and are screaming at you. So, guys, I, I am not anti-market. I'm anti lots of money in the market. For people who are retired, let's get a lot of answer to this. Again, what's our job for people who are pre-retired and retired? When I say pre-retired, within a couple of years retirement and retirement, what's our job for them? Protect their money, but we can't just protect their money because we could bury it under a big money, a big rock in the backyard. Maintain lifestyle, Bruce. That's right. We need to stay at about three percent rate of return, or not make it grow. Not well, because if we make it grow, if that's all we're trying to do is make it grow. That's the mistake that most advisors make. Is they go, I gotta, I gotta make my clients' money grow. I gotta grow, 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 grow. Wrong. What do we need to do? Maintain their lifestyle. So what kind of rate of return do we need to get to, return, to maintain their lifestyle? Yeah, 3, 4, 5% at the most. Okay, so should we be looking for unbridled growth? No. So they still had to have some money in the market because I still have half of my money in the market for the last uh, 20 years. I've had half my money in the market, half money in FIAs. Half in the money market, half in the FIAs. That's where I've had all my money. And guys, I'm not an idiot when it comes to investing. So, but I still do that. Why? Because I have. I don't care how smart you are when it comes to investing. You don't know what's going to happen next year. So, but I still have money in the market because I believe. You know, I'm an optimist. I think that the the economy will continue to grow. The world will the economy will continue to grow. That we take two steps forward and one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. But right now, are we in the two-step forward situation, and are we prepared for the one-step back situation? Because that's what I think we're in. We've already had our two steps forward. Second longest bull market in history, that's our two steps forward. We now have to be prepared for what? The one step back. And there's nothing worse than when people pull money out when the market's down. 
And if you have money in FIAs, if you have a big chunk of their money in FIAs, they don't feel the need to pull their money out. But gosh, when they've had all their money, all those people that had their money in Ken Fisher, all those people that had their money in Ken Fisher in 2008, what did they do? Because he had them 97% in the market. What did they do, ride it out? No, they pulled it out. So they all lost 50%. So if we're in FIAs, if we're in 50, 60, 70% FIAs, and 50, 40, or 30% in growth, are they likely to keep their money in there for a longer period of time? Yeah, because they don't panic. But when all your money's going down, that's crazy. So it makes sense? Uh, just wanted to let you know, there's a little bit, a little enhancement to the end of the 21. When we, when we do the end of the 21, we always review their 21 items, right? Going from, we went from 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 21, and then we're going to go from 21 back to 1, making sure that what they realize is that not that they have all these problems, but they have one, one problem. And what's that one problem they have? When we review the 21 backwards, 21 through 1 for 10, 15 minutes, yeah, they're advisor, Perry, exactly right, they're advisor. But here's a little enhancement. After we do that, we ask them three questions. Do you have a clearer picture now than when we first started? And they always say what? Yep. Then we say, do you want to keep doing what you're doing now or make some changes? And what do they always say there if you do it right? Changes. Now here's the enhancement. I always used to say, where do you see me fitting in? Where do you see me fitting in? Where do you see me fitting in? And that worked fantastic for me. And it, it worked fantastic for the last 15 years. But Jeff said lately, uh, uh, Jeff, what's been happening when, when people ask, where do you see me fitting in? Yeah, it's, it, it seems like people have like this deer in the headlights look. Like they're, you can hear it on the tape where they're like, oh, I, I don't know. I mean, what do you do? Um, <laughs> so, so here's the enhancement. Instead of having it too open-ended like that, I'm going to say, so do you want me hands-on with making these changes? Because I said they want to make changes, so I'm going to say, do you want me hands-on with making these changes, or is this an academic exercise with me? So what do I mean by hands-on, guys? What are they going to be forced to say when hands-on means what? Now, do you want me to help you move that money, not me as the advisor, right, Jonathan? Do you want me, am I your guy, bud, right? So do you, do you want me hands-on with making these changes, or is this an academic exercise? How many people are going to say this is an academic exercise? I don't know. This is a change that we made. I'd like you to give Jeff and myself feedback that when you say this, instead of where do you see me fitting in, the kind of feedback you're getting. And Jeff, would you help me monitor that and let me know how that goes? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So does that make sense, guys? Can we get some yeas or nays? Do you think that's a little bit of an improvement, or is that easier for you to do than just saying, because um, I know Jeff said a lot of you guys were getting a little trepidation about asking where do you see me fitting in because too many people were saying, well, I don't know. So, so this should should help, okay? Okay, what I want to talk about today is the a property casualty in a couple, for a couple of reasons. So um, when we give, you know, what's the definition of advice? Advice is guidance or recommendations concerning a prudent future action, typically given by someone regarded as knowledgeable or authoritative. Um, and remind me, hey Jeff, would you remind me at the end about uh, uh, advice and about uh, benefits? I want to talk about both those things at the end here. Sure. Okay. So when we give advice, if we're a financial advisor, what should does that, do, are we a financial? Or are we a, an investment advisor or a financial advisor? Now, if you're an investment advisor, just give just give advice about investments. But if we're a financial advisor, what is contained in financial information? What's contained in your financial situation? Just investments or lots of other things? Yeah, lots of other things, everything. In fact, here, financial planning, financial advice, social security optimization, insurance, investments, employer benefits, risk, if you're a business owner, education, estate, tax returns, assets, goals. This is all of financial planning. So if we're giving financial advice, uh, um, we need to talk about everything, not just the investments. See, that's what we're doing. So property casualty is part of what? Part of their financial advice that we should give them. Even if we sell, don't sell it. But this is, this is what most advisors talk about, right? Who cares about all this other stuff? We just want to talk about what? 
investments. They're investment salespeople. We don't want to be those investment salespeople. We want to be financial advisors. Okay. So just want to talk about one little area that uh, that um, uh, people may not be aware of. Property casualty companies are giving cancellations and non-renewals to lots of people lately. Because and why are they doing that? Because the cost of, the cost of repairing a car has gone up or down. Cars are much safer than they ever were before, but the cost is going up or down. It's going way up. Why? Because of all the safety equipment on there. A little bump on the bumper now what? Can cause severe problems because of all the, the electrodes and measuring things are in the bumpers now. So it's all sorts of uh, problems. So they're giving cancellations continually now. So here's some things that you may not be aware of. They will cancel you or non-renew you if you have a poor credit score. In fact, here's what they found out. In 37 states, people with poor credit pay more than twice as much as people with excellent credit. Twice as much. So you think, what does that have to do with your home insurance? What does that have to do with your car insurance? But guess what? Twice as much. Because they figure if you don't have good credit, you don't take good care of your, your things. And that's, you know, whether that's right or wrong, that's what they believe. How many of your clients are aware of that? So what should you do if somebody has, is, is, do you think it's a good thing for us to ask people what their credit score is and, and why and let them know that, that's the, that as a financial advisor, if they have poor credit, we'd like to help them get their credit uh, or move their credit score up. And is there lots of ways to move your credit score up? Guys, just Google, if you run into a client who has something like that, just Google uh, increasing credit score and there's lots of ways to do that. Because credit score is affecting everything nowadays. If you get um, infractions and driving points, it's going to obviously affect not just your auto insurance, but your home insurance as well. They figure if you're wild and crazy on the roads, guess what? They feel like you're not going to take very good care of your house. So they can cancel your home insurance because of that too. So which, there are ways to get rid of that. You can actually call your state and there are ways to get out of or lower the points that are on your driving record by taking driving safety classes and things like that. And every state is different, but you can help people do that. Uh, if, the, if the previous owners made lots of claims, guess what? That will affect your homeowner's insurance. So what can you do about that? Well, there's this thing called Comprehensive Loss, uh, Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange, CLUE, C-L-U-E. Comprehensive Loss Underwriting Exchange, C-L-U-E, and you can look that up online, but it, it's a record uh, of, that all the insurance companies share with all the claims that you've made previously. So if there's lots of different claims from the previous owners, that can affect and they can cancel your home insurance. Small claims, so if you make lots of small claims, a little claim for this, a little claim for that, a little claim for this, should you do that on your home insurance, guys, or your car insurance? Should you do that? No, because what happens, Wade? Wade says no. They will cancel you, or they will jack your rates up so high because you're, you're a nuisance to them. And do they want nuisance claims anymore? Not even. So, story I annoyed you with my thirst for knowledge. And a lot of you guys know this, but I was surprised at how few people don't know this. Should you call your insurance company and ask them about whether you should file a claim for a particular thing or not. No, because they <laughs> that whether you file that claim or not, it goes into the clue. It goes into that uh, uh, comprehensive loss underwriting exchange. They make a note of that that you were calling and wondering about this thing. So if you call, you want to call for a brother, and they said it's it's amazing. If you if you call, uh, this is not for me, but it's for my mother. It's not for me. I know that this is kind of a joke when you when you you know when you say uh, you, you make this uh, um, you know it's not for me, but it's for my mother, or it's not for me, it's for my brother. But they're saying go ahead and do that, even though everybody knows you're talking about yourself. If you're saying it's for your mother or your brother, guess what? They will not enter. They will not enter it into the clue system. They will not enter it into the comprehensive loss and underwriting exchange. So go because they don't know for sure whether you're lying or not. Are they going to say? Are you lying to me? Is this really for your mother or is this for you? So just go ahead and uh, play the little game so they will not enter it into your home insurance. Make sense? Also, these, <laughs> these insurance companies now are doing drive-by inspections. 
they're looking. Is your gutter leaking? Is there a window that's cracked in your lawn? Is the lawn not taken care of or the landscaping not taken care of? And it's causing them to jack people's rates. Okay? And here's a big thing. They see a trampoline in the, in the yard or they see a, a pit bull or a, do, a, a, a Doberman Pinscher or a, a, a Mastiff or a Great Dane in your yard. Guess what? Many insurance policies now will not uh, insure you if you have a trampoline. They will not insure you if you have, uh, I think it's like 12 different breeds of dog. And if you read, if you read in the small print, how many people you think realize that in the small print it says trampolines negate their insurance? How many people you think know that? And how about people that buy a, a Doberman Pinscher or a German Shepherd? Do they, have they even thought that's going to affect their home insurance? So these are things that you can help them out with, okay? But the main thing I want to talk to you about today, that's just a little thing. The only reason I show you those things is not because it's a huge issue you should cover with your clients, but to realize that home insurance is a huge thing. It's a huge thing, and we can use that as leverage with our clients. So if you look at the 21-point checklist meeting, under the num part number seven, property casualty and umbrella insurance, there's two different scripts, one for property casualty and one for umbrella. umbrella. And um, what I want you to do is look at the crib notes section and the audio for to, to, to the property casualty checklist. So here's the um, property casualty checklist. And I'm going to go ahead and play the um, training tape, OK? And watch as I go through all these things, because I want to make a point at the end. It's not all that long. It's about five minutes long. And so I'll listen to, to um, what happens as I go through it. So drag this up here so you can see where this is. A meeting process, 21 point checklist. We're going on here, property casualty, and I'm going to go to um, the audio. Oops, don't want to go. Hey, Tricia, where did we have that audio? It's under the brush. It's right here, right? Under the brush up. Okay. Here we go. Next thing we need to talk about is property casualty insurance. So, you know, when you watch the news, we see more or less fires, floods, catastrophes. Uh, more. It seems like there's one every night. Yeah, there is. So do you think it's costing insurance companies more or less money? Well, I'm assuming more. Yeah, it is more. And do they are in the business of making more or less money? No, they want to make more money. They do. So they've taken a, tri a trick right out of the, the uh, 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 hands of the, cereal, the breakfast cereal company. And breakfast cereal companies, they realize we don't want to spend $10 a box of cereal. So guess what they've done to the boxes? Make them bigger or smaller? Probably smaller. You're right, they are making them smaller. And so what the insurance company's done, do you think they're adding more benefits or taking benefits away to the home insurance of their customer? Probably taking them away. They are. And you know, and I, and I started to get industry bulletins on this, and I didn't believe it. I thought once I bought insurance, they couldn't change it after the fact. But they said they were, and they said that was in the annual perspectives. You know that 30 or 40 page book that they send you every single year that, that I have never read until, until just recently? Yeah, well, we never read ours either. Yeah, who does? Who does? So guess where they were making these changes without telling us? On the front page where we would see it or buried in the middle? Probably buried in the middle. Yeah, they were changing my policy and telling me if you don't like it, contact us, but they weren't putting it on the front page. They're putting it in the middle. Which, why would they put it in the middle? Probably sure we shouldn't see it. Yeah, exactly. And here's the changes they're making. Here's the changes they're making. I'll give you one example. I thought uh, they changed it from replacement value to actual cash value, which is just gobbledygook. What that actually means, though, replacement value means that, hey, if my roof is destroyed and it needs to be replaced, I expect it to be replaced and uh, with full value. If it costs 15000 I expect $15,000 to replace it. And that's how I bought my insurance. But see, they had changed it from that to actual cash value, which means that they said, hey, every year your roof gets older, it's worth less. They depreciated it. Does that make sense? They depreciate every every time they the year they were saying my roof was worth less because it was getting older and older. For example, let's say that um, they said my roof was worth a thousand dollars less every year because it got older and older. After ten years, what's ten thousand? Or what's ten years times a thousand? Well, ten thousand. Yeah. So I bought when I first bought my policy, it was a replacement value. So I thought if my fifteen thousand dollar roof is damaged. They will give me how much money? Fifteen thousand. But 
because they changed the actual cash value, again, without, well, we'll, we'll get into it, without calling me and telling me, they just buried it in the middle of the, the policy. Now, if I would have not caught this, I would have thought I would have got 15000 but instead it would be 15000 minus the $10,000 in appreciation. So what's 15000 minus 10000 Well, that's 5000 It's 5000 So I think I'm going to get how much? Well, 15. And instead you got, I get what? Five. So how upset am I going to be? Well, I imagine you'd be really upset. Yeah, and they changed it by burying it in the middle of that annual prospectus. And they said, hey, listen, if you don't like this, call your agent and go ahead and upgrade for more money. If I hadn't known that, I would. I, what kind of a pickle would I be in? Yeah, you'd be in a big pickle. I'll give you another example. Water damage can cause a lot or a little damage to a house. Well, both. Yeah, both. But I'm not worried about the little. I'm worried about the what? The big. The big. Yeah, is that a few dollars or can it be tens of thousands of dollars if it floods the basement or floods down a wall? And I mean, no, that can be really expensive. It can be really expensive. You're exactly right. So they've changed water protection in, a, in several different ways. Just one of them, as an example, is they say now many companies say we need uh, uh, if the if the damage is started to occur 90 days prior to when the claim was filed, we're not covering it. So if they can prove that there was a drip or, uh, uh, 90 days prior. If they can prove that there was a damage to the house 90 days prior, and then uh, this big water damage occurs three months later, guess how much they're covering? Nothing? Nothing. So how much could I get hit in my pocketbook when I thought my insurance was actually going to cover it? And that sounds like tons of money. Yeah, tons of money. If I hadn't seen that they made these changes, that's just one of the water changes they made. They made several different water changes. And if I hadn't known that, what kind of a pickle could I be in? Yeah, a big pickle. So have you, you know, what, I hadn't seen my agent in years. I called him right away. But when was the last time you've seen your agent? <laughs> we haven't seen him for forever. Or, or let's say that out of role play. Let's say they said they have seen you. Yeah, we, we've seen our agent just recently. Super. So did you go through all the changes they've made in the prospectus? Well, no, no, we didn't go through all that. No, yeah, and most people I talked to hadn't. Now, here's the thing. When you pay a premium every year, does your agent still get paid? Yeah, he still gets paid. Well, he, he, here's why I bring that up. When you come on board, we actually give you a property cash checklist, which will make, uh, which will go through and make sure that you know exactly what you have and see any changes that have been made that you possibly have missed buried in your annual prospectus all the years you've had it. And are those changes important or not important to know about? No, they're very important to know about. Yeah, they're very important to know about. But should you have to do all the work? Are you getting paid when you put the premiums in? Are you getting paid or is the agent getting paid? Well, the agent is. So, guys, why is it so important to make a point number nine there? Why is it so important to pick, make point number nine that I'm making? Make the agent work for their money. Checking, uh, checking out where I'm paid. Well, not, so I guess a little bit. Demo, the agent's not. Ah, very good, Wade. So it's not another thing the client has to do. It's making it sound easy. The client has to, doesn't have to do the work. Exactly right. Now, if all we do is go up to this point, all, we, is, is it, um, all we've done is said it's a good idea. So a good idea isn't a bad thing to do, but a good idea doesn't really get us anywhere. Because these people are living their lives. They're driving the cars they want. They're going out to eat when they want. They go on vacation when they want. So how much work will they do for a good idea? Well, that's one of the reasons we're saying, hey, bring this back to your guy. But as far as getting them to move their money, what have we accomplished is always given them is a good idea. Nothing, right. So you've got to wind this up with number 10. So listen to how I will wind it up with number 10 here. So here we go. If you don't do number 10, all you're doing is looking like a good, a good guy, which isn't a bad thing, but it's not going to get them to move the money. But we can actually leverage property casualty to get them to move the money. So let's listen to how we do that. Who should have to do the work of filling out this checklist? Well, he should. Yeah, he should. And then he'll give it back. So you don't even, we're just, when you come on board, we give you this checklist, you give it to him. You don't even have to do any work. He's going to do the work, fill this out, and then we can sit down or you can sit down with him either way 
to make sure you know exactly what's covered, exactly what changes have been made, and so there's big surprises or no surprises. So there's no surprises. Exactly. So again, you're going back to your home insurance agent. He's the one getting paid. I don't sell home insurance. I don't get paid. Why the heck did I just wait seven, eight minutes on this? Well, I don't think it's a waste. This is, this is important stuff to know. Yeah, I think so too. So why do I spend time talking about this when I don't actually sell it? Well, because it's important. It is important. And if I call myself a financial advisor, is losing ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars because you didn't know how your home insurance was set up? Would you classify that as part of your finances? Well, I'd say that's part of finances. Yeah, so if I'm a financial advisor, I don't know better to make sure that your property casualty is good or not good. Well, you, yeah, that is good. So I hope you understand why I cover these things. I don't like my people to have uh, nasty um, uh, surprises. So the next, when you come forward, we get the property casualty checklist. I can review it after your agent does. Okay, so what am I doing there, guys? What's the last step? What's number 10 all about? It's the same thing we do at the property, I'm sorry, at the power of attorney, where I say, hey, what kind of an advisor would I be? Why am I even covering the power of attorney? I don't get paid to do that. What kind of advisor would I be? What kind of advisor would I be? So let's take a look at this. Where are we going to do that? If we look at the 21-point checklist, we, we're going to do that at the power of attorney. What kind of an advisor would I be if I didn't cover the power of attorney? Because do they look at the power of attorney as being something an advisor normally covers? No. So I'm saying, well, what kind of advisor would I be? So they start to think, wait a minute, that is something he should do. How about with identity theft? I do the same thing. What kind of advisor would I be if I didn't cover identity theft? Because how much could that hurt your finances? What kind of advisor would I be if I didn't cover property casualty? What kind of advisor would I be if I didn't cover umbrella liability insurance? So see, I'm, I'm, I'm now, when I've done the tutorials, I've added that. So now we have motive, excuse me, motive for power of attorney, for identity theft, for property casualty, for umbrella liability insurance. And we didn't have it in the previous scripts for these three. So we've just made it a little stronger. And do we ever mention the guy here? No, we're having them connect the dots that, hey, if Mike would be a bad financial advisor if he didn't cover these things, wait a minute, my guy didn't cover this either. No, I'm not, here's the thing, Dane, I'm not establishing credibility. I'm not establishing credibility. Because what will credibility get you guys? What will credibility, guys, everybody answer this. What will credibility get you? If their advisor is run over and dies, yeah, then it will get you a client. Is this meeting about establishing credibility, guys? Yeah, pat on the back is all it gets. So what is this meeting about? What is the only thing we're trying to accomplish at this meeting? That they think, oh, I'm a great guy. Oh, I'm credible. Oh, I'm an expert. Oh, I'm smart. Is this meeting about me at all? Now, wait a minute, Jeff. I'm saying this meeting isn't about me, but on these four things, on power of attorney, identity theft, property cash, and umbrella, I'm saying, what kind of an advisor would I be if I didn't do this? Why, how can I, if that's part of the script and I'm saying that, Jeff, why am I saying this meeting isn't, isn't about me? Well, because we're trying to get them to think about their guy. So we have to do it through the back door in the beginning um, by asking them, what kind of an advisor would I be? But we're implying that anybody that wouldn't do that, including their guy, uh, wouldn't be a very good advisor. Myself, the guy next door, the guy that you have, anybody that wouldn't do that wouldn't be a good advisor. The thing about credibility is it, it's exactly the problem. You, you, you don't want to go, is there anything wrong with building credibility throughout the process? No, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you understand that credibility gets you no clients, especially when the market's 20,000, that's his credibility. His credibility is I took your money when it was when the Dow was at 10 and I shepherded you through to 20,000. That's his credibility. Um, you, if you build credibility, all they're going to say is, hey, we got a guy that's credible right now, but if he ever stops being credible, he loses our money, um, well, we'll just come back to you then. And the problem for you is we don't know when that is. Uh, that could be two months from now, that could be nine months from now, that could be two years from now. But the real problem is even if it was only two months from now, they still wouldn't work with you because they'll either have forgotten about you or they'll think, well, we can't do anything until we make some of this back. So there's nothing wrong with building credibility as long as you don't fool yourself into believing that that gets you clients. Yeah, this is all about the other advisor. I'm Just like Jess says, 
all these things here, all these things on the list are not about these things. It's an excuse to talk about the advisor. So when I'm saying, when I'm talking about myself, I'm not really talking about myself. I'm using it as an excuse to have them connect the dots and talk in their own minds about their advisor. Now, the reason I don't mention their advisor, hey, did your property cash, did your advisor look at your property cash insurance? Hey, did your advisor make sure you have umbrella liability insurance? Hey, did your advisor make sure you have any of that? It's too early. I'm just laying the groundwork so by the time I get the titling and beneficiaries, they've already connected the dots and it makes these easier. So as I get down further and further, I'm not even mentioning the guy here at the fees and the interest rate volatility and they're getting more and more pissed off at their guy without me even saying it because I laid all the groundwork right here. Make sense? So, and then, guys, again, all of these scripts now have tutorials. How should you be learning the scripts? By reading the scripts or doing the tutorials, guys? I want everybody to answer this. By reading the scripts or doing the, tutor the video tutorials with the, the crib notes in front of you? Good, everybody's saying tutorials. The, the reason I don't want, no, not both, not both, not both. Tutorials only and crib notes. Why? What do, crib, what do scripts get you guys? Nothing. Because then you're memorizing words. The tutorials is about learning why we're doing what we're doing and saying it five, six, seven, ten different ways. It's also making sure that you're learning it instead of just, Reading the script over and over and over again. No, do the tutorials. And how many of the tutorials should you have done by now, guys? Because I, I harped and I screamed and I pleaded and I begged and I fell down on the ground gnashing my teeth all through December that you would use December to get through all of them. I hope that you're through all of them. If you're not, clear your book, clear your calendar, and do the tutorials. If you do the tutorials, it's like the people have the script. If you do the tutorials like the people have the script, okay? When you do that, when you do that, when you've mastered all of these things, guess what? Any client that you want we, becomes yours. Why? Why do we make that claim? It's not even a claim. Why do we state that fact? Because if the client spends an hour and a half, two hours, two and a half telling you why they don't trust their guy, guess what they do? So if they're not telling you at the end that they hate their guy, can't trust their guy, and what they want to throw their guy into the fires of hell, then what do you know about your you and the tutorials? What do you know about you and the tutorials? If they're not saying they can't stand their guy, that he's a thief, what do you know about you and the tutorials? You need to spend some more time together. Now, I'll just be straight with you guys. Uh, I'm wondering if how many of you have done all the tutorials. I know some of you have because I've listened to some of your tapes. You're doing awesome on it. But some of you haven't. And, and here's the thing, guys. I've had a guy say, well, Mike, you know, it's just I'm running my business and I'm trying to do this. I just don't have time to do it. I said, well, tell me about your day. And he goes, well, I, I, I get to the office at 9, you know, and then I've got clients and I've got to run out here. And, he's, you know, he's showing me his calendar. So sure enough, you know, he, from 9 to 5, he was busy running around working with clients. So what did I tell him? I guess, you know, I guess you don't have any time to do it. What do you think I told him? Because he showed me his calendar. And from 9 to 5, he, you know, he was busy. So what did I tell him? Oh, I guess, I guess you're right. You, there's no time to do it. Tom's got it. So I've got some people say, hey, come in at 7. Come in at 8. What's that get him, guys? What does that get him? Jack shit. Gives them one hour, two hours. Guys, how many hours are there in the day? So when he said he didn't have time during his eight hours to do it, what did I tell him? That he had no desire to succeed. Because if you have a desire to succeed, you say, geez, I can't get this stuff done between nine and five. No, when do you do it? Guys, Jeff and I laugh. When we were in the military, we worked 24-7, no days off. 24-7, seven days a week. 24-7, seven days a week. Did I go in and say, geez, you know, how am I supposed to get all this stuff done? What, you know, what do they think they would have done? When I was at Best Buy, I worked, as a manager at Best Buy, I worked 
12, 14 hour days. And when I wanted to get into this business, I had to study for my series seven. What did I say? I never, guys, I'd still be working at Best Buy if I, if I had that mentality. When do you think I studied for my series seven? I worked 12, 14 hours, got home eight, studied for my series seven, went to bed. Got up, went to work 12, 14 hours, got home, <laughs> studied for the series seven, went to bed. Did I watch TV? Did I play with the kids? Did it, no, what did I do? Now, if I had to do that for the rest of my life, Jeff, would I have done that? Oh, no. You would have burned out. So do they need to do these tutorials for the rest of their life? No. Hi. You can get the tutorials done in 30 days. I Less if you really to... wanted to, but 30 days is reasonable. <laughs> exactly. And then you know the language. Then it's not like I'm sentencing you to bust your butt for the rest of your life. Bust your butt till you get these scripts down, and then you're going to live a life of leisure. Make sense? So thank you to everyone. I'm surprised at how many people did take December and master these scripts. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Those of you who haven't, here's the thing I'll say. Unsuccessful people do. I'm sorry. Successful people do what unsuccessful people refuse to do. So those, uh, I don't know, I probably talked to maybe 20 guys that have, uh, for sure I know mastered the scripts in December. So those are the successful guys, and they're already seeing success with the, the, um, the eye to eyes this year as compared to last year. They're already closing people that they set, told me they'd never have closed last year. But if you haven't taken time to do tutorials, guys, you make time. If you don't have time during the day, then you make time at night. Don't tell me you got to watch The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. Don't tell me that you got to watch your favorite TV show. Don't tell me that you need time to, to unwind and have your glass of wine. Bull crap. For the next 30 days, you should be doing what? Master the tutorials. Become successful like the guys that have already done it. And these are some of these guys were pretty good beforehand, but the tutorials have put them on uh, right on the, the, the on a straight up, uh, on a track to go straight up this year, because they're already they've already told me they're closing guys that they had no chance of getting last year. Okay, so prioritize, right, uh, Andre? Make sense? Anything to add, Jeff? Before I let everybody go, did you have something you wanted to say about advice versus benefits? Oh, I did. Advice versus benefits. What did I want to say? Uh, that's okay. I yeah. can't remember. Well, so, well, here's what well, I you know. I think, that's, I think that's what I covered is that, that we wanted to make sure uh, with the tutorials, that, oh, I know what it is, the benefits. I, I'm going to go right back here just to let you guys know. Uh, so just bear with me and then we be done in one minute here. I want to show you one more thing. If you guys have not watched uh, this video, please watch this video. If we go to marketing and then we're going to go to eye to eye and then we're going to go to uh, did it right here. See this 3216 in benefits video, seven minutes long. 3216 in benefits video, seven minutes long. Please, if you have not done that yet, please go there and read that because in our um, mini elevator speech in our marketing, we always talk about the thirty three thousand two hundred sixteen dollars in benefits that we're able to find people on average. So if you're not familiar with what those are. Go to this video so that you can uh, understand what we're talking about, so you can be uh, supremely confident when you're saying that. Make sense? And what you're going to find is this is a minimum of what we're going to find. We can generally find way more than this, but what I found is if you claim a number, bigger number, they'll never believe you. So this number is big enough to get their attention, but not so big they won't believe you. But this number is minimum. This is not the average we say people. We say people way more than that. So please watch this video when you get a chance. Thanks, Jeff, for reminding me. Make sense? You guys have a great rest of the week. Look for the Wednesday um, Five Minute Money Maker and the Thursday um, uh, Tape Breakdown. Make sure you don't just listen to them. Make sure you put them in action. You guys have a great week. We'll talk to you next Monday. Thanks, everybody.